Good morning. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll just wait another minute or two and then we'll get going. Good morning and welcome. I'm going to share my screen one more time and see if I can avoid having these little boxes in the way. But well, welcome, everyone. My name is Brian Campbell. I'm the executive director of the Iowa Environmental Council. We're thrilled to have you with us for our virtual Environmental Advocacy Day. We hope that you'll learn a lot about what's going on at the Capitol right now and how you can be involved. And then we'll talk at the end about a couple of upcoming events we have, including March the 2nd, when we invite you to join us and lots of our member organizations to be at the Capitol to talk with legislators in person, um, in addition to all the other ways that you can communicate and raise your voice um, between now and then through lots of different means. So, as most of you probably know, the Iowa Environmental Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non governmental, statewide policy and advocacy organization. We're over 26 years old and are the largest and most comprehensive environmental coalition in the state. So, we have over 100 member organizations and thousands and thousands of supporters across the state, like you, who work with us to impact and um, help advocate for good environmental policies. Today, we're gonna to hear some updates from our staff about things that are happening at the Capitol right now. We're gonna also have uh, remarks from several different guests. There will be time for Q&A to talk about some of the issues that we hear about. And then we're gonna spend a chunk of time doing some training and helping all of you to think about how you could be most effective in your advocacy. At the end, we'll have some more time for Q&A and conversation. So thanks for joining us. Um, just a quick rundown of who's gonna be speaking. So in addition to myself, we'll have Ingrid Gronstall, Carrie Johansson, and Alicia Basto from our team. We'll hear from Senator Chris Kernoyer and Representative Chris Hall. We have speakers from a couple of our partner organizations that we work with, Sakawas Nobis from Great Plains Action Society and Charlie Wishman. He's a labor leader in the state. And we'll have some remarks from Senator Sarah Trangier. So I wanna hand it over now to Ingrid Gronstall to share some updates on things that are happening with water and land stewardship at the Capitol right now. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Brian. And thank you all for joining us uh, this morning. It is nice to um, be able to speak uh, virtually to this this crowd again and give an update on what's going on at the Capitol. Um, I just uh, want to start with a quick rundown of our water and land policy priorities. Uh, these are the three main buckets um, that we work on in the policy arena. And then we have legislative priorities that are distilled down from that. Um, so first reducing and mitigating agricultural pollution. Uh, because the vast amount of land use in the state is intense row crop agri agriculture, 
um, that is the uh, leading cause of pollutants such as uh, nutrients, uh, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, and bacteria, pathogens, uh, sediment, a, a lot of different pollutants entering our waterways, and that's the most critical uh, issue fa facing water quality in the state. So um, we work on policies around that. Uh, one of the main ones uh, is working to strengthen um, the nutrient reduction strategy and, and reduce the, um, uh, uh, reduce the, um, or I'm sorry, eliminate the voluntary uh, uh, nature of non-point source uh, compliance and, and go with a regulatory structure. Uh, we also are envisioning a, a different landscape in the state that um, focuses on uh, various uh, multi, uh, diverse multifunctional, um, uh, multifunctional uses of the landscape. Um, this is, again, a state that is focused intensely on row crop agriculture. Uh, and basically water quality and environmental quality have been um, uh, basically re relegated to externalities of agricultural production at this point. But if we envisioned a state where we invested in water quality, we invested in outdoor recreation, we invest in public lands, um, opportunities for small communities to have tourism or recreation-based businesses and, and revitalize um, communities across the state, uh, you know, that's, those are the kinds of policies that we're looking at and the kind of long-term vision that we have for the state. Um, and along with that flood mitigation and climate resiliency, I think most of the uh, cities in um, the state that, most of the main cities in the state um, uh, over the last decade have had a catastrophic flood or two. Um, so this is a, an increasing problem um, and climate change is one of the um, overarching uh, policy priorities, uh, uh, program priorities of the of the organization, along with environmental justice. Um, next slide. So I want to review quickly, um, going from that overarching review of policy and and legislative priorities going into session. I'll just give a quick update on a few bills that are actually um, in play this session uh, up to this point. Um, one of the main bills was introduced last week, um, and this goes, uh, this flies in the face really of what I was just talking about. Um, this would restrict, uh, basically put a cap on what um, Iowa Department of Natural Resources or county conservation boards could spend on land acquisition. Um, the ostensibly the reasoning behind that is um, so that uh, organizations, uh, governmental organizations don't compete with young farmers for farmland. But um, these are, you know, usually when um, county conservation or DNR are acquiring land, it's because it's marginal land, not prime farmland. Um, a lot of times it's because the person um, is selling their land to, or, or done farming and wants to put their land into conservation. And this would restrict the amount they could actually receive for um, putting that land into, um, into conservation. So um, uh, this is uh, uh, definitely a, a bill that we're concerned about. It's moving fairly quickly. It moved out of subcommittee. Uh, last week, uh, last Thursday, despite having um, uh, a packed subcommittee room and uh, over 100 people on the Zoom uh, meeting and virtually no one, I, I think no one from the public uh, spoke in support of the bill and it still moved out of subcommittee. Um, there's a committee hearing on this bill this afternoon. Um, again, it's funnel week, so uh, all bills have to make it out of uh, committee by tomorrow to be still alive for the session. So I imagine they're trying to get this one through. Um, we will put a link in the chat um, where you can attend virtually, uh, attend the committee meeting virtually, but this is definitely one to keep an eye on as it seems to be moving fairly quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another bill uh, that we are actually feeling fairly positive about, this is a bill that we worked on last year as an amendment, um, uh, amendment language, and it didn't make it onto that bill, but we uh, introduced, we um, 
worked with Representative Kaufman uh, to get this introduced as a standalone bill this year, but essentially it um, includes natural infrastructure approaches like um, wetlands restoration and uh, floodplain reconnection um, as explicit flood mitigation tools that counties can use in their um, authority to uh, mitigate flooding. And so this is something that's important to us. Natural infrastructure solutions um, like wetlands and flood restoration also have water quality benefits. They have habitat benefits. They can have outdoor recreation benefits um, as well as um, uh, potentially carbon sequestration benefits. So there's, a, again, this goes into a multi, multifunctional, um, multi-beneficial landscape. So uh, this is something we are um, excited to watch move through. There hasn't been much in the way of opposition. It has already passed out of committee. So it is um, it has passed the funnel already. Um, so this is a bill we're, we're uh, quite, this is one, um, uh, one hopeful piece of legislation to hang on to so far this session. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another bill that has gotten quite a bit of attention is the Senate tax plan. Uh, this tax plan would um, uh, finally raise the sales tax and uh, fund IWIL. So this is um, something, uh, funding IWIL, the Natural Resources and Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund is something that we've advocated for for a long time since uh, the constitutional amendment passed in 2010. And um, this is something we have been waiting to see for a while, uh, but the, and I apologize, my dog is getting ready to bark. So I apologize if that, if that uh, happens right now, but um, hopefully she'll calm down. Uh, but the, um, the Senate bill also does a few other things that we are, there she is, less excited about. Um, one is eliminating the local option sales tax. So basically this is a switch. Um, they raise the state sales tax, eliminate local option sales tax, and then um, some of that uh, sales tax is slated to go back to governments, uh, local governments. That's something that there's concern on, on local control issues, but also um, how all of that money gets distributed. We haven't seen a fiscal note on this bill yet. Um, so a lot of those questions are up in the air. Um, it also, um, all three tax plans in the legislature right now um, go are produce a much more regressive structure uh, for taxes in the state. So all of them either flatten or in the case of the Senate bill, eliminate the income tax. And income tax is really the only progressive um, form of taxation we have. So um, with a more, uh, sales tax heavy, less income tax um, tax regime overall, we're going to see um, a lot of the, the, the um, low income communities, disadvantaged communities, communities of color bearing the burden of um, these, these tax structures. So that's something we're concerned about, uh, especially again with our um, focus on environmental justice and wanting to make sure that our, our policies um, serve everyone in the state. Um, and there are also some changes to the original formula um, that uh, de-emphasize outdoor recreation and emphasize um, giving uh, uh, taxpayer money to farmers for conservation practices in accordance with the uh, nutrient reduction strategy, which is um, a good thing, but also, uh, you know, one of the main uh, outdoor recreation is in the name of the trust fund. So um, we're disappointed to see that um, de-emphasized in uh, the current proposed formula. Um, next slide, please. So with all that being said, um, we have, uh, I think, I think the likelihood, it's, it's hard to say at this point whether um, I will, will make it into a final tax package. Uh, the tax bills are funnel proof. So right now we haven't seen anything move on those bills um, in the last week or so. I think people are focused on um, bills, making, getting bills through funnel and then they'll go back to um, the tax bills after this week um, for floor debate. But I think, um, you know, because the governor's tax plan and the house tax plan don't have I will funding in them, um, I'm. I'm, it's hard to say whether that will, um, that piece will make it into any of the final tax packages. Um, one thing though, we started this 
uh, a project last year um, to do a broad-based um, public campaign, uh, basically reminding Iowans what the trust is, um, what it would do, uh, how it would benefit Iowans and our environment and our communities. Um, and we are moving forward with this campaign. I think um, now is a good time to, to remind people that this was meant to be um, a conservation focused um, initiative, not rolled into a larger, very wonky tax policy discussion. Um, and we wanna build more public momentum for environmental um, for environmental issues across the state. And, you know, I think part of um, the challenge that we're having up at the state house is just a lack of, um, maybe a lack of influence, a lack of levers to pull when it comes to negotiating and, and fighting for the things we care about. And so I think the best way that we can do that at this point is to have a broad-based um, grassroots public campaign with I will as a, uh, a catalyst, but I think this um, would uh, translate into a lot of different priority issues that we have, you know, working on public lands. Um, the Senate bill that I talked about kind of flies in the face of um, the Senate tax bill funding I will, um, but also funding I will, but also um, restricting uh, the amount that we can, that that the government can spend on public land acquisition. So again, that's de-emphasizing public lands and outdoor recreation opportunities in the state. And um, for a whole host of reasons, including quality of life, um, re uh, recruitment and retention of talent, um, just making Iowa a, a nice place to live. Um, I think this is the kind of um, rallying cry that a lot of people across the state are hungry for. So we're, we're excited about this initiative, excited to be working proactively instead of a reactive position um, to what bills are, are coming out. So if you're interested, um, please visit fundthetrust.org or contact um, Alicia or me. We can give you more information and um, please consider getting involved. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to um, Carrie Johansson, our energy program director, to um, discuss what's going on on the energy side. Great. Thanks a lot, Ingrid. <clears throat> um, it's also been, uh, it feels like we just got into session and um, things have just been moving really fast. Um, but to Kind of jump back to early January, December last year, we were thinking about what our priorities would be for the upcoming session. Um, you'll see, you know, not not anything um, too unfamiliar to those of you who have been working um, or uh, uh, coordinating with us for a while. Um, first of all, just protecting and expanding Iowa's clean energy leadership, and this falls into a number of categories including, of course, protecting distributed clean energy policies like net metering and third-party power purchase agreements, preventing any new barriers to that small-scale customer-cited renewable energy projects, and then ensuring that no utilities are allowed to discriminate against customers who do have renewables. Second bucket is really about utility scale um, renewable energy as well. We support renewables at all scales, and we think it's really critical to maintain Iowa's wind energy leadership and to grow utility scale solar in the state as well um, by continuing to have a well-defined legal framework that supports wind and solar development, um, as well as sufficient high voltage transmission infrastructure that we need to carry significant additions of renewable energy. We wanna see, <clears throat> existing state and local policies that are good for clean energy and energy efficiency protected. Um, we don't wanna see any additional rollbacks to policies that do result in state and local gains on, on those areas, um, especially when it comes to customers with a low income. And we support policies that will increase equitable access to clean energy like community solar, low income and multifamily energy efficiency and expanded options for utility bill repayment. Um, and finally, um, in that bucket as well is increased access to clean transportation options. Um, our second bucket of priorities falls into electrification. There are a number of areas of the economy that 
um, need to move towards electric um, if we are going to take on climate change. Um, and not everything can be electrified, but what we can electrify, we need to electrify. And as we move further and further towards um, clean electricity, we will clean up these other sectors as well. So that includes policies that allow for development of electric vehicle charging infrastructure throughout the state while encouraging competition, consumer protection, and fair taxation, and supporting policies that incentivize EVs, including clean transit vehicles, and move consumers to the use of clean electricity for more applications like space and water heating, which will cut carbon pollution and reduce dependence on fossil fuels while saving customers money. We've all seen um, the natural gas price spikes this winter that have led to um, everyone trying to use much less natural gas. Um, and if we were using electricity uh, to cool and heat our homes and cook, um, we wouldn't be um, having the volatility of high natural gas prices, what we're seeing right now. Um, Finally, our last bucket here is to support an equitable transition to clean energy. And that means that uh, no one bears more burden for um, any energy transition costs and that everyone also shares the benefits that come with transition to clean energy. Um, so this is really on a broader scale, looking at how our utilities also choose to transition to clean energy or um, how they're allowed to transition by the Iowa Utilities Board. And there are some tools that we think are important for utilities to have. Um, and one, um, one such tool is called securitization. Um, and that, that tool would reduce the costs of closing coal plants and um, uh, moving to renewable energy. It could also be a tool for transition assistance for workers and communities. Um, another very important piece of the puzzle when we're talking about um, nine coal plants still operating in the state of Iowa. Um, there are workers and communities who are affected when those plants shut down, and that's something that we really need to be thinking about. Um, and we want to see, um, you know, when, when it comes time to pay for um, closing the coal plants, um, transitioning to renewables, we want to see rates, um, customer rates that are equitable and allow all customers to benefit from the addition of renewable energy into utility generating fleets. So we don't want to see you know, cheaper renewable resources um, shuffled off to specific customers to lower their energy rates while, every, while everyone else continues to pay for the more expensive fossil fuel energy. We um, in the same vein of thinking, you know, we, we know with this, the transition that's happening in energy right now. Um, in Iowa, we've, we've had really a growth mindset when it comes to renewable energy. That's been a really good thing. It's put us really out front at the same time with everything that's happening. It's an especially important um, time to be planning. And so um, we um, are looking to anything that will give um, the utilities board, um, you know, utilities uh, incentives or requirements to plan for the future so that customers um, and uh, everyone who's concerned about climate uh, can know what the plans are for the future. Um, we definitely have our eye out for policies that are going to exacerbate existing environmental and energy inequities. And we will be advocating for legislation that helps address historical injustices and creates more equitable systems for participation in the benefits of the clean energy transition. And finally, um, we are supportive of any legislation directed towards addressing climate change adaptation and mitigation needs in Iowa. As much as we know that um, we, uh, you know, we need to absolutely reduce to zero um, our greenhouse gas emissions, um, we know that uh, we're already seeing impacts today on communities and in our state, across our state of climate change. And so adaptation um, and building things to the future that we can expect with climate, as much as we um, know what to expect, is an important part of this as well. Can you jump to the next slide? So there are a number of other bills that we're watching. If you're on our um, list, our uh, legislative um, news bulletin list, but I'm going to talk about three of them today. 
Senate file 2127 is a bill that IEC is registered in opposition to. And this bill would create um, extreme setbacks for solar facilities um, and restrict development to land that is below 65 CSR, which is stands for corn suitability rating. Um, and it would require a spacing between solar facilities of a half a mile. Um, now that is, um, all of these parameters are not um, parameters that are workable for a solar project in Iowa. Um, the CSR rating alone would restrict development to um, a third of Iowa counties. Um, and then this, the setbacks and the distance on top of that um, would really be a killer for additional solar in Iowa. These are decisions on siting that are typically made at the local level right now. Um, and counties have really been wrestling with this issue. Um, and it's not one that should be uh, sort of done on a piecemeal basis. This bill did pass through the Senate Agriculture Committee, um, so it is through the funnel on the Senate side. However, um, it is our understanding that it is unlikely to move forward um, this session. Uh, however, this is not an issue that is going away. These are very robust conversations that are happening at the local level um, and increasingly are filtering up into the state level as well. Um, you know, the Iowa Environmental Council has been um, sharing resources on siting with local governments for several years now, about four years. We've had best practices documents out there and we've been educating um, locals about the best way to do this to balance the interests of, of um, participating and non-participating landowners in the area. And so we hope to be a robust part of any discussion of statewide siting. House Study Bill 697. Um, is a bill that passed through a subcommittee on Monday, um, the House Agriculture Subcommittee. Unfortunately, this bill did um, was voted down in the full um, House Agriculture Committee um, a couple of days later. So it did um, fall through the cracks in the funnel. Um, this is a bill that would have allowed uh, virtual net metering where um, up to 10 people could sort of pool their resources behind the meter to offset their energy bills. Um, this is a really uh, good policy for um, any entity that has multiple electrical meters, for example. So a campus, um, a business or group of businesses, um, agricultural operations that might have, you know, locations kind of scattered around an area. Right now, um, if you have, in order to net meter, you have to have your physical facility behind the meter at the location um, that where, where it's offsetting the usage. And this would have allowed more flexibility um, for people to, um, to have a solar at a main location and offset their usage even at um, a few different locations. Um, it was unfortunate that that was voted down. It was not something that utilities supported. Um, hopefully this is not the end of that conversation. We know that we need more options in Iowa for uh, everyone to be able to benefit from solar. Um, that includes policies like virtual net metering, um, as well as community solar, as I mentioned earlier. I uh, wanted to highlight also um, Senate Study Bill 3123. Um, this is a bill that is a live round, um, and there is um, a house uh, companion for this as well that I did not um, get up here on this slide. Um, but these two bills are um, bills that were put forward by the governor's office as workforce bills. Um, they're very long, um, include just a lot of different provisions. Um, one of those provisions, uh, well, a number, a number of, it affects a number of building codes, um, but in particular, um, what it does is it takes the 2012 energy code is what Iowa has currently adopted as a standard um, for building codes. We are deep into the process. Um, the appointed board that does this is deep into the 
the process of adopting the 2018 energy code. Um, this would take the 2012 version of the code and just put it right into Iowa law so that any changes or updates to the code would actually require an, a piece of legislation to do that. Um, it's very onerous. It is um, not a nimble way to um, decide how which technology should um, be included as you know the cutting edge standard. Um, and uh, we have a lot of concerns about this. Um, you know, one really baseline issue is that energy codes are health and safety codes. It's not an extra sort of nice thing to have more insulation, et cetera. Um, you know, as we work with better and better building materials, um, houses are getting tighter and tighter just by the nature of things. And so um, if you're not updating your energy code for things like ventilation, uh, moisture control, et cetera, at the same time that you're tightening up your envelope, you're gonna end up with mold, air quality problems. So this isn't just about um, making homes more efficient, though that is an important piece of it to save people money and not <laughs> be leaking energy uh, all over the place and wasting money. Um, but it is actually a health and safety issue um, that's really important. Um, we're also really concerned uh, that in a workforce bill, we would be um, really stopping Iowa uh, and people who are gonna be working in Iowa from being up to speed. Um, on the latest um, requirements of technologies, things like that. Um, so we really, you know, when we're buying a home in 2022 that's brand new, um, we don't expect 2012 technology. Um, you know, we wouldn't want, um, <clears throat> uh, we wouldn't buy a new computer that's loaded up with Windows 8 um, as the standard um, and put that in Iowa law. That's just not a practical, approach. And so um, so we're really concerned about this bill. Um, there, are, there are a number of other bills that we have our eyes on. Um, but we are uh, those are the those are the ones I'm going to highlight for you here today um, and feel free to reach out with any questions. Thanks. I'll pass it back over. Greetings. This is State Representative Chris Hall from Sioux City, here to offer a few legislative updates for supporters of the Iowa Environmental Council. So far, the legislative session has been dominated with headline-grabbing topics, mostly dealing with education, but there are still several bills dealing with energy and the environment that are moving ahead as well. On Tuesday afternoon of this last week, a House Economic Development Subcommittee passed House Study Bill 540. This bill would push the repeal of the Iowa Energy Center to 2027, extending its lifetime an additional five years past the sunset date of July 2022. The full House Economic Development Committee then passed the bill unanimously on Wednesday. It now awaits a floor vote. The Senate also has a similar bill in their chamber, which is a good sign that it will continue to move forward. On Wednesday afternoon, a Senate Agriculture Subcommittee moved forward with Senate File 2127, affecting the development of solar panel fields. The bill would create a new set of requirements for any new large-scale installation of solar panels. It would also limit the types of land eligible for installation of solar panels to land that has a corn suitability rating of only 65 or lower. The practical impact of the bill would be to ban utility-scale solar farms in Iowa. Of course, it's a very divisive bill, and advocates from the environmental, solar, labor, and utility industries are trying to stop the bill because it would effectively stifle the development of next-generation renewables. Visiting with advocates and those on the Senate side, they don't believe that it's going to move forward and ultimately make it to the governor's desk. At this time, there is no House Companion Bill either, which is a good sign that it will not. Next week, beginning with Valentine's Day, is what many in the legislature call Funnel Week. 
Funnel week is a procedural deadline that winnows the available number of bills that can be considered, meaning that virtually all bills that don't pass out of a full House or Senate committee by Friday, February 18th, will be considered dead for the session. It's an opportunity that hopefully kills bad bills while allowing the good ones to continue moving forward. One such bill that I would like to see move forward is scheduled for a subcommittee at the start of the week. House Study Bill 697 would allow for net metering on solar installations. In recent years, we know that many in agriculture have begun to see the benefits of solar panels and how they can offer some benefits to their operation. The House Agriculture Subcommittee is scheduled to meet Monday, February 14th at 11.30 a.m. Please reach out to your legislators and encourage them to support House Study Bill 697 as it's one of the best bills that we've seen introduced from the Republican majority dealing with solar energy this session. That's all for now. I'm Chris Hall. Take care, have a happy Valentine's Day weekend, and keep in touch. Hi there. My name is Charlie Wishman, and I serve as president of the Iowa Federation of Labor, AFL-CIO. Over the past few years, we've been partnering with lots of different groups and different coalitions because it's pretty clear that in Iowa right now, to get anything done, you need to work with partners. Nobody is big enough to do anything on their own. And that's why um, we have, with environmental partners, created something called the Blue-Green Alliance. And I think that it's really important for us to be able to maybe put aside some things that we don't agree on, but also find the things where we do agree on and work together on them. We've had some really, really good successes recently and on the local level and places like Lynn County and so on. But when it comes down to it, it I, I think that really some of the most important things are what we've learned from each other. I've learned so much from our green partners. And I think that a lot of uh, folks have understood now too that when people talk about creating green jobs, they don't always mean good jobs. And so with that being said, um, you know, we, we've uncovered so many different times where there's been uh, really, really bad working conditions, bad pay, bad benefits. Um, uh, you even had temps walking off the job in different places. Now, because of that, um, I think we've helped uh, uh, educate a lot of folks on the green side, what a good green job really is. But really when it comes down to it, really when it comes down to it, um, it's, it's all about education and about getting to know each other and finding places where we can agree and work together and make Iowa a better place. And when I say people on the green side or people on the labor side, those are really made up silos that don't even exist because there's so many of us on the labor side that consider ourselves green proponents and there's so many of us i think um on the environmental side that they care about workers so this is a great coalition i think there's going to be great great things ahead and let's keep working together thanks a lot hello my name is sakawis also christy nobis and I'm Plains Cree Salto of the George Borden First Nation, which is uh, in Saskatchewan, Canada. I grew up in Winnipeg, uh, Canada, not too far from there. And I've been living in Iowa City for 16 years now. Uh, I am the executive uh, director and founder of Great Plains Action Society, uh, an Indigenous-led uh, climate and social justice organization uh, working uh, on, on all sorts of issues uh, across Iowa and the Great Plains. Um, here in Iowa, I feel it's very important to advocate for the water because Iowa is uh, ground zero for big ag uh, throughout the world, I feel. Greetings. This is State Representative Chris.
is uh, in Saskatchewan, Canada. I grew up in Winnipeg, uh, of Great Plains Action Society, uh, an Indigenous-led uh, climate and social justice organization, uh, working uh, on on all sorts of issues uh, across Iowa and the Great Plains. Um, here in Iowa, I feel it's very important to advocate for the water because Iowa is uh, ground zero for big ag uh, throughout the world, I feel, uh, and also uh, a sacrifice zone um, that, uh, you know, corporations have taken over for the purpose of uh, producing uh, food uh, yeah. that uh, will be overly processed uh, for ethanol uh, and, uh, and feed for um, animals. So what's being grown in Iowa is uh, not very sustainable and not very healthy. Uh, and also what's uh, being put onto these crops, to these monocropped and GMO crops across the state is uh, poisoning our water and eventually poisoning us. Poisoning us. Uh, and um, right now, Iowa is the uh, number one contributor to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. States are uh, moving in the direction of adhering to the Clean Water Act. Iowa is uh, doing the opposite. Uh, our uh, current governor uh, is uh, promoting or uh, for even in introducing more concentrated animal feed operations into the state, as many as 30,000, uh, which are highly responsible uh, already, the 15,000 we have, for the pollution of our water. Um, you know, water is um, is life, um, which is something that Indigenous peoples uh, have uh, spoken about uh, clearly for uh, generations uh, and has been made uh, very, very clear uh, with the Standing Rock movement, uh, which uh, was protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline, which yeah. actually started here in Iowa. Uh, so Iowans know how important water quality is, how important keeping the land safe is, uh, but yet the state refuses to listen. So that's why I advocate so hard. That's why Great Plains Action Society advocates so hard uh, to um, uh, introduce better you know, laws um, and, uh, and, and, and mind mindsets about how we treat the land and the water, because we feel as indigenous peoples, we are the stewards of these lands and we need to, uh, to stand up and, and speak strongly uh, to settler descendants that we feel are perpetuating colonial capitalist farming practices that are harming you know, sacred places um, and spaces and, uh, and, 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 and everybody's uh, health. Um, in the meantime, you know, uh, the way we treat the water, the way we treat the land also affects the climate. And so it's all linked and uh, we need to do better. Thank you so much for listening to me. Oh, hi, everyone. This is Senator Chris Knoyer. I represent Scott and Clinton County in the uh, Iowa Senate, which is on the east coast of Iowa. I live uh, right on the Mississippi River between LeClaire and Princeton, which is just north of the Interstate 80. Uh, so uh, right now uh, in the Senate, I serve as the chair of the education budget. I'm also vice chair of state government, and I'm also on the appropriations, education, and natural resources and environment committees. So um, it's a real honor to be part of this day. And I want to thank Ingrid for inviting me. Um, you know, before I was on, uh, before I was a senator, this is my fourth year in the Iowa Senate, I was a school board member. So uh, for six years, I was a Pleasant Valley School Board member. And uh, one of my big priorities or um, tasks was to advocate for public education. Um, so I had to talk to my legislators and tell them um, why we needed certain things done or certain policies moved um, and why it was important to um, the students and parents and educators of my district. So um, I was just going to share a few of those advocacy tips with you uh, today. Um, and, and something that they taught us in training was the ABCs of advocacy. A is be accurate. You want to make sure that you're always giving us accurate factual information because um, uh, as you know, uh, this place runs on trust. And once you lose someone's trust, it's very hard to get it back. So um, providing accurate information is really important. Uh, the B would be be brief um, because, uh, you know, especially during session, uh, we're being pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, so if you can be respectful of people's 
last time. Um, usually, you know, like a 30 second elevator speech and a one pager uh, that kind of uh, talks about what your priorities are, um, you know, with links to more information or contacts if they need it. Um, that's also very useful. And then the C is be creative. So, um, you know, and I'll leave that up to you on how you want to be creative. But, um, you know, there, there's certain people that just really stand out to me in terms of how effective their advocacy is. And, you know, it usually is uh, being very positive and respectful. Um, and I know that sometimes that's hard to do, um, especially in this political environment. Um, sometimes the, the legislator that you're talking to doesn't always have the letter behind their name that, that you agree with all the time, but that's the person that you have. And especially if they're in a, a position where they can really make a difference, you know, a difference in terms of being like the chair of a committee um, or someone that can make or break a bill, um, always having that positive, respectful interaction is very, very important. And something that I did as a school board member was reach out to my legislators and just say, hey, um, you know, I understand that education isn't your passion, but if you have any questions about any education bills, please reach out to me as a subject matter expert. So um, just as it relates to this organization, um, you know, I'm not a farmer. I didn't grow up on a farm, uh, you know, but I, I represent a pretty rural district. And so I try to be very mindful of the people that are, are actually out there doing the work. So I, I have several farmers in my um, district that are very avid water quality um, people. And, you know, they have invited me out to their farms to show me um, their, their buffer strips and their cover crops and their bioreactors. And um, that has just been so helpful in letting me understand what's being done out there to help with, with these water, water quality and soil health um, issues. So, um, and I appreciate last, was it last summer, Ingrid, that we went to, um, yeah, we went uh, out to, it was kind of Northern Polk County and we went up in a little plane and uh, uh, got to really see it from the aerial view point and see some of those conservation um, uh, initiatives and pr uh, things that people are doing that really just gave me a much better understanding of the practices that are being out there. And, and it was really great to talk to one of the farmers. He was a multi-generational farmer that was very proud of what he was doing in terms of conservation and water quality. So um, truly appreciate that. And, and I think in terms of advocacy, if you can, you know, if you can get a legislator out to a field day or, you know, out to see some of these practices, um, I, I just think that's really powerful. And especially if it's in their home district where they can see, you know, here's the issue, here's why, you know, funding of this initiative or, you know, the passing of I will, or, you know, these are things that will be supported by those um, policies and those, those funding sources. So um, I just think, you know, telling a story and really um, making it personal. And, and especially if you're talking to the Senator that lives in that district, I think that's really powerful and, you know, go to forums. I think it's really powerful too, when people come to our legislative forums during the session and talk to um, you know, to bring up some of these issues that might not necessarily be brought up at the forums. And you're not only asking a question of the legislators, but at the same time, you're educating everyone in the room about what these, um, what these policies are and what these practices are and why it's important for, um, you know, the future of our natural resources in the state of Iowa. So lots of stuff that you can do. Um, and, you know, I, I would say create, you know, establish a relationship with your legislator now. Um, don't just go to them when you have a problem. It, it's so important, especially, you know, if a legislator sees you as a friendly face, somebody that they know that they can count on for good information, um, you know, whenever you go to them, um, they're gonna be more willing to take that phone call or take five minutes to talk to you when they've already established a positive, um, respectful relationship with you. So thank you. I, I just really appreciate your efforts, Ingrid, and your entire organization. I think you've done a really good job um, getting around the state and um, you know, working with all the different stakeholders. It's and you know, I'm really glad, you know, this isn't an us against them thing. We all have to work together in this ecosystem um, to protect our natural resources. So, you know, I appreciate appreciate what your organization does and the, and the angle that you come at it from, um, because this is important to all of us. So um, there is some good legislation coming through with our tax bill in terms of, you know, um, I will. Um, the, I will is triggered in the Senate version of the tax reform bill. I'm very excited about that because I think that that will provide us with that funding stream that we need for, um, you know, water quality initiatives and recreation in our state, you know, with our workforce issues and, you know, 
we talk about um, what does it take to get people to stay in the state or be attracted to the state of Iowa. And a lot of it is that quality of life and recreational opportunities and, of course, clean water. But, um, you know, we, we really have to take care of what we have here in Iowa. And, you know, I come from a hunting background. Um, my, we've got some land down in uh, Van Buren County. Um, but, you know, we, we fish, we hunt, and we want to make sure that um, those resources and those opportunities are available for our future generations. So I just want to thank you and your organization for everything that you do to advocate. So thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. That was great to hear from our staff and so many partners. Uh, we have some time now to do some Q&A to ask about some of the legislation you just heard about, um, some of the comments you heard about from staff and partners. So please go ahead and use the Q&A box that you'll see down at the bottom of your Zoom controls um, and go ahead and type questions there. Carrie, do you want to start off? Uh, looks like we have one question that came in so far. <clears throat> sure. Um, so yeah, the question is about what's happening with the carbon pipelines and eminent domain. So there are a handful of bills that are out there that would um, impact um, that area um, of focus and um, I have not seen that any of those bills have been scheduled for a subcommittee yet. We are tracking those bills. Um, we are registered um, as undecided on the bills that are out there. Um, you know, we, uh, we I, I spoke earlier about um, the importance of transmission lines in um, taking renewable energy to market. And so, you know, we look really carefully at any bill that would impact um, large infrastructure projects for that reason, and any bill that has unintended consequences or cross-cutting, um, cross-cutting impacts. So, um, yeah. So for, for now, we are undecided on those bills, and as I said, I haven't seen any of them start to move yet. Yeah, and I would say just to add to that on a more general level, you know, we have been tracking these carbon pipeline proposals for many, many months, as I know lots of you have. Um, I think there are lots of open questions about, you know, what what the short term and long term plans are with those pipelines. And so, you know, we have been having lots of conversations with different partner organizations, with different people with expertise and um, you know, we think there needs to be a really robust conversation in the state um, about any big infrastructure projects. Um, and certainly, you know, as Carrie said earlier, lots of lots of climate action is going to require complicated infrastructure projects, but we need to do those in the right way and do those really thoughtfully. And so um, we hope that those conversations can happen before there's things like eminent domain and vote. So keep your questions coming into the chat. Um, Carrie, do you want to take this next one? We have a question um, about what are the potential economic benefits of renewable energy, um, especially in rural communities? Uh, you know, how you talk some about the transition, um, whether that's in communities that have existing fossil fuel um, generation facilities or in other communities, how is renewable energy you know, economic opportunity for rural Iowa? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there are a number of ways that rural communities benefit from renewable energy projects. Um, you know, we've see, we see more and more um, rural communities, school districts, et cetera, investing in their own um, solar, for example, to offset their energy usage. Um, so, you know, communities are investing directly. That's kind of a no brainer if you have the right utility policy in your area. Um, when we're talking about larger scale renewables, um, Iowa tax policy is, is set up 
um, pretty nicely for local communities to benefit from renewable energy projects. So you've got um, about $70 million a year in tax revenue that goes to counties um, that host wind projects. And um, as more utility scale solar is coming online, um, you'll have revenues from solar as well going to counties. And this is typically divided up. I mean, it depends on the county you're in, but um, we've seen counties, you know, invest really heavily in infrastructure, roads and bridges, senior meal sites, healthcare, um, natural amenities like a nature center um, down in Madison County that was created. Um, you know, there are there are all kinds of um, there are all kinds of things that you know tax revenue can be used to make the community um, a nicer place to live for the people who are there. There's also been a lot of um, revenue that has been used just to avoid tax increases. So keeping property taxes, county level taxes, nice and low for the people who um, who live in the counties. And so that's been that's been a big benefit. You know, you also, um, the renewable energy companies um, pay um, substantial amounts of lease payments to uh, farmers and landowners who live um, in these areas. And so um, I think we're uh, approaching something like $80 million a year in land lease payments to, um, to Iowa farmers and landowners. Um, and that really helps, you know, in, in an ag economy that is up and down all the time, um, and is only getting um, more uncertain with climate change from year to year. It's a really nice um, option for a farmer to be able to have a part of their operation um, in renewables, to be receiving lease payments um, as a guaranteed source of income every year, um, not relying entirely on the ups and downs of the market and input prices and all of the things that influence whether you know you make money in any given year or not. So. That kind of um, that kind of stability um, is so critical for people in rural communities to feel more secure about the future, um, and so you know the, all of those things are big benefits. And then I you know I loved what um, Charlie Wishman was saying earlier about good jobs. Um, you know I think one really uh, recent cool example of um, you know where local labor can be a really important piece of this as well is um, with the Coggin Solar Project um, that was recently approved in Lynn County. Um, the, co the company signed um, a project labor agreement. And so local labor um, at prevailing union wages will be used in that project, um, which is a huge benefit to the local community. Um, I could also go on and on about, you know, the benefits of resting the soil and pollinators and but I'm going to stop there because uh, there's, there's a lot more I could say, but I'll leave it there. Thanks. Yeah, so we are in the midst of a massive transformation, but there are real opportunities for local communities across the state, including rural communities, um, as we transition to clean energy. Thanks, Carrie. So we're gonna pivot a little bit. We have a question about soil health. Um, at this event last year, we had um, Norla Momsen, the legislator also from Eastern Iowa talking about a soil health bill that he was working on, um, was reintroduced this year. Ingrid, do you wanna give us an update on what's happened with that bill and with conversations about soil health broadly? Sure, great. Uh, so I can talk a little bit about soil health uh, there was a bill, um, House File 801, uh, again, that um, we uh, partner organizations worked with Representative Momsen to get that introduced. Um, it basically uh, would have included soil health language in the powers of um, soil and water conservation districts. Um, it made it through funnel last session, which means, um, and, and then it didn't get taken up by the Senate. And so it was still, um, uh, because of the biennium of the legislative session, uh, it still was uh, alive for this session. Um, but uh, based on the current political climate, um, Representative Momsen decided not to reintroduce the bill. Um, it, it seems, uh, uh, it seems like it was a it was a non-starter in the Senate for a few different reasons. Somewhat disappointing 
uh, for us to see. Um, and I think that's another illustration of, of why um, we, we just need some more um, uh, political capital and, and public pressure on the environmental side um, to give legislators a reason to move forward on these, these things that, you know, soil health is something that farmers want. It's a big buzzword. Um, it's something that farmers are concerned about um, across the political spectrum, you know, as we talk to people around the state. So um, this is something that should have broad support broad-based support and it's surprising that it isn't. Um, so that's something we'll continue to work with our partners on uh, going forward. All right, thanks for the update. Yeah, we have another question about um, water and land stewardship. So um, I'll just read this one and then I'll um, pass it to Alicia Vasto, our water program assistant director. So. As far as the natural flood mitigation bill that Ingrid talked about and natural infrastructure, um, are counties currently limited in you know, what they can use for flood mitigation, um, how they can use natural infrastructure, um, or is the bill you know, just highlighting this as a possibility? So you know, talk a little bit about the current state of things and how this legislation would, would improve on that. Yeah, so this bill um, is adding language about natural infrastructure to actually change that was um, brought about by a bill that passed last session. So that um, previous, the original bill added emergency or added um, flood mitigation to a county's emergency powers. And so they specifically listed out um, projects like levees and flood walls and other kinds of gray infrastructure that counties could use um, for flood mitigation as part of their emergency powers. And so we wanted to get this um, language added about natural infrastructure to make sure that that was a possibility for counties to be able to use as part of their emergency um, powers. So um, yeah, it's kind of um, adding, adding to the, the tools and the toolbox that counties can, can use to uh, prevent or mitigate flood impacts in their communities. And um, if you're interested in um, more information about natural infrastructure and how it benefits communities, we have um, a few uh, resources and um, that link has just uh, been shared in the, in the chat box there. So um, please check those out if you're interested in learning more about natural infrastructure. Thanks. Um, yeah, Alicia and, and or Ingrid, I wonder if you want to share a little bit, um, you know, we're focused especially on legislative issues today, but we had um, an important decision yesterday um, from the Environmental Protection Commission, which is another place that citizens can you know, raise their voices um, and another place that we as an organization have raised our voice about um, helping to strengthen the laws that we do have on the books. And, and so, um, yeah, would you like to give us an update on, you know, remind folks of the petition that we filed and and the status of that now? Sure, absolutely. So we uh, last year, uh, about six months ago, we filed a petition um, asking the Environmental Protection Commission, which is the citizen board that um, sort of oversees DNR, is responsible for. Um, approving uh, rulemaking processes for the DNR. Um, we asked them to strengthen um, protections for siting livestock facilities in uh, sensitive areas, particularly karst terrain, um, and asking them to protect um, uh, surface and groundwater sources. Uh, this was um, prompted somewhat by the Supreme Beef uh, decision by the DNR to, to site a CAFO. Uh, up in Northeast Iowa on karst terrain in the watershed of an outstanding Iowa water um, and a naturally reproducing cold water trout stream. Uh, and, and basically the, the, the thought here is if you can cite a CAFO there, um, you can cite a CAFO anywhere. You know, the existing regulations are clearly not protective of, of uh, um, public health and the environment and, and not screening out these facilities that are being located in places where they clearly shouldn't be. Um, so we filed this petition um, 
yesterday, uh, the EPC met and voted to deny our petition. Um, the DNR had given us a heads up a few weeks ago that they were going to recommend denial, uh, but they are planning to, they, they did put together a um, KARST uh, task force and, and they um, spent a, a decent amount of time looking into our arguments about what, what separation distances should be um, between um, manure storage um, structures and, um, and uh, 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 geographical, no, geological formations. Yep, uh, in in those areas, um, and they are they uh, yesterday um, announced that they are planning to do a more holistic rulemaking about um, their karst rules, siting and karst rules for all livestock facilities, um, and they're um, targeting doing that rulemaking process this year. And and they said yesterday potentially. Um, having a proposed rule out by the end of March, early April. So even though we're disappointed that they denied our petition, um, they also uh, claimed that DNR didn't have authority, legal authority from the legislature to uh, require groundwater monitoring in, in karst areas or um, uh, use the director's discretion rule um, more broadly. Um, and, and those were, were uh, we, we disagree with those decisions, but um, we are happy uh, that the DNR um, is going through with this rulemaking process. Um, we don't think that's something they would have done without us pushing uh, with this petition. So um, that's a, a positive step forward. They're going to do a broad-based stakeholder process and we'll be um, heavily involved in, in that. So um, stay tuned for hopefully um, some reg uh, changes on the regulatory side. Yeah, so if, if anyone is interested in being engaged with that process, you know, we'll keep you updated on it. There will be opportunities um, for filing public comments. And as Ingrid said, if you are somebody who has, you know, particular expertise or, you know, personal connections to um, Northeast Iowa karst terrain to some of these, um, you know, especially vulnerable um, areas, this would be an opportunity to speak up and help to shape what those rules look like. Um, so lots more to do, but yeah, um, a silver lining to our petition being denied yesterday, at least. So we have one more question. Um, you're welcome to add more if you if you have any additional, but we'll, we'll just um, go with this one for the moment. So is there any attention being given to concerns about PFAS in our water? Um, there's been you know, several communities around the state where drinking water um, contamination has come up, but also you know, in our food chain. And, and so, yeah, what's um, IEC doing about that and what are other um, you know, agencies doing to pay attention to PFAS concerns? Uh, as, as far as the legislative side, um, uh, Representative Eisenhart introduced a bill um, regarding regarding PFAS. Um, to my knowledge, it hasn't gotten a, a subcommittee hearing yet, so I don't know that it's going to um, make it past funnel this session. Um, I do know that the uh, Iowa DNR has been fairly proactive on, on PFAS. They have a um, PFAS action plan. Um, uh, I will say because uh, PFAS is not an agricultural pollutant. Uh, I do think there is more appetite uh, at the state level to address it, um, or at least less opposition to, to take action uh, as far as addressing PFAS. So DNR has a fairly good um, uh, action plan on PFAS. It's something that we, um, you know, we're tracking as an emerging contaminant, uh, but it's not in our um, uh, primary uh, uh, policy goals at the moment. Yeah, so it's definitely something we're learning lots more about. There's increasing federal funding and attention to this as well as in the state, and we'll continue to, to pay attention to that. Uh, one more question that came in just now, and um, I'll let Alicia Vasto take this one. Um, yeah, so we just heard a little bit about um, animal feeding operations. Um, what are some opportunities and efforts around the state to combat the continued spread and 
um, harmful practices related to CAFOs, um, any efforts organizing and working at the local level or the state level. Um, yeah, com common, you know, every year these are things we're thinking about, we hear about different approaches, but um, what can you tell us about that right now? Yeah, so there are definitely um, local groups around the state that are leading efforts on raising awareness about CAFOs and um, trying to have an influence at the local level for um, citing of CAFOs. So, for example, there's um, the uh, Powashi Cares Group in Powashi County, there's the Iowa Alliance for Responsible Agriculture, there's JFAN in Jefferson County. And there's the Save Bloody Run group that was organized around the um, Supreme Beef situation up in, in Northeast Iowa. So those are some great local groups to get involved with. Um, our, the, the fact of the matter is that the laws in the state are so weak around CAFO siting that it's really hard to have a lot of local influence on siting. It's just not built into um, the laws that we have. So that's why IEC has been really focused on changing rules related to CAFO siting. That's why we filed this petition and we're planning to take other actions. Um, similarly, that will help change the laws around this so that we can have more options to have uh, local impact and local control about siting. Um, because right now these, um, you know, groups are, are really great at, at getting organized and um, spreading awareness, but it's hard when the, the structure of our laws and our rules is so lax and so skewed to agricultural interests that um, even a gr group of well-meaning organized citizens uh, uh, has difficulty um, actually making a difference or having an impact on, on CAFO siting here in the state. So um, they're great groups to get involved with, but uh, our tactics then um, trying to change the laws around CAFOs and start there. All right, thank you. Looks like there's one more comment in the chat. Um, so uh, thanks to Jane Shuttleworth for that. People can um, see the phone number there to make comments on um, 3134. Ingrid, Juna. Yeah, I was just going to mention, Jane, that's the same, that's the public lands bill that I was, uh, that I talked about earlier in the presentation. There's a committee mean, meeting at um, 2 p.m. this afternoon. So um, yeah, I would, would agree with Senator Hogue that uh, now is the time to let uh, those committee members know how you feel about uh, the bill. Oh, Governor. Yeah, we had close to 200 people, you know, in the room and online. Um, last week, speaking against that bill at the subcommittee meeting, um, you know, it'd be great to have lots of people raising their voices again this time. All right, well, thanks for all these great questions. Thanks for all of you for being engaged in these issues and paying attention to the, to the details as well as the big picture of, you know, where we're headed as a state, what we care about, what values are guiding the kind of policies that, that we're supporting. We're thrilled to have uh, Representative Sarah Tran Garrett with us. Um, and she's gonna share some thoughts about um, what we can do to be effective advocates, um, more reflections on the current legislative session and how we you know, continue to build a movement for the kind of just sustainable state that, that we all wanna see. So coming to you live from the Capitol, good morning. Representative Tran Garriott, um, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. Hey, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm never sure with the mask on and the earbuds in. I'm going to move to a place where I can take off my mask so you can see my face. Um, I am state senator for the west side of the Des Moines metro. And while I'm walking, maybe a nice little tour of the Senate chamber. <laughs> um, and it's really important for me to hear from not only my constituents, but people all over the state, because how um, a bill might impact my community may be very different from how my, a bill will impact another community. And I think it's really important for lawmakers to understand that 
um, because we have a diverse state. There are diverse needs, um, diverse concerns. And so we need to think about the big picture when we're doing legislative work. And so that's why I encourage everyone to learn who your elected leaders are and make sure you reach out to them, but also reach out to other folks who have power in the decision-making process. There are chairs of committees that decide whether bills move forward. There are leadership um, positions that decide whether we debate something on the floor, whether we allow amendments. And it's really important that all those folks hear from you. Um, sometimes a legislator might say, you're not my constituent, so I don't need to listen to you. But I think that's not a good way to proceed because we make decisions that impact the entire state. So we really do need to be hearing from all people in, in our state of Iowa. And it's, it's really helpful for me to learn about um, the issues of concern um, all over the state that I may, may never have thought about, but are really, really important to some folks. And that's part of our job. And so I'm the ranking Democrat on the Natural Resources Committee. And we are going to be having that committee meeting a little later today. There's a number of bills um, on the slate that are of concern. So just a couple that I wanna point out that you've probably talked about today. Um, Senate Study Bill 3134 is a bill that um, it prevents landowners from selling their land to an entity that's going to use that for public space, um, prevents them from selling it at market rates. So it's telling them that you cannot get full price for that land. You have to sell it at a markdown, which seems like interrupting the free market process, but then also unfairly punishing efforts to expand our public lands. And today we had lots of folks from different hunting and fishing organizations with us in the Capitol um, who came to visit. And they've resoundingly said, this is a bad idea. A lot of the lands that we would want to sell the conservation groups are in floodplains, they're um, streamlands, they're land that isn't good for agriculture that should be used for public land. And that there's some really important efforts that they wanna support um, for the good of Iowans. And Iowa has very little public lands. And so the more public lands we can have for recreation, for water quality initiatives, um, for just um, habitat and wildlife is really, really important for us. And it also helps us achieve some of the goals that we've set forward as a state, um, including the nutrient reduction strategy, um, which we are really far behind in reaching. Um, and there was another bill today that I cannot recall the bill number right now, but it has to do with expanding hunting access for out of state folks. And it seems like that's a bill that um, a lot of people are opposed to in the hunting and fishing community because we um, already don't have enough public land for folks to hunt. And so it, it's really hard for Iowans to have access to, um, to hunt, to be able to um, be part of that recreation and that this would actually incentivize people buying land so they have their own private hunting reserve to come to Iowa and could um, you know, actually limit hunting access even further for a lot of Iowans. So I've, I've heard a lot of folks speaking out against that. So I'm very concerned about that. Um, and I'm not sure if there are some things that you all would like me to speak to or if you have some questions. So Brian, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to um, see if other people have questions, um, either from staff or in the chat or in the Q&A feature as well. Go ahead, Alicia. Oh yeah, go ahead. All right, sorry, Ingrid and I <laughs> in sync turning on our mics. Um, yeah, I was just gonna ask Senator, um, you know, kind of what you're feeling from the overall tone of what's going on at the Capitol this session. And um, are there any things that you are optimistic about? Or um, uh, I guess just what's kind of the feeling that, that you're, you're experiencing going through this legislative session? About how much access and um, 
involvement, we allow the people of Iowa in this legislative process. So I'm seeing a lot of bills moving to subcommittee very quickly. That's the only time that people have the opportunity to speak at a public hearing. And I saw a question about speaking at subcommittees. Um, that is a public forum. So in the Senate, you can join on Zoom or you can be there in person. You can speak either way. And I think it's a really great opportunity for folks all over the state to be able to speak without having to drive to the Capitol. We should never limit the engagement of the public. Um, but often these meetings are a half an hour or an hour. I actually have one starting at 10. So I'll have to do a hard stop just a couple minutes before. Um, and the public doesn't get a lot of notice that they're going to be discussed or when they're happening or how to even be involved. So it's really important to me to share that information and try to put that out there. So I do a lot of tweeting. I do a lot of Facebooking. Um, I try to put that information in my overly um, detailed newsletters because I think it's my job as a legislator to make sure people understand um, those opportunities are there for them. Um, but it's very concerning to me to see a school funding bill move from subcommittee to full committee to debate in two weeks. Um, we have a very significant tax bill that lots of changes to our tax code. Um, and we really, really need to do the work to make sure we understand the full impacts of that. And I feel like in our process, it gets rushed. Um, I've seen a number of cases where, you know, something moves from an idea to being filed to subcommittee to committee to um, debate on both sides. It's happening at the same time in one week. So we saw that with voting restrictions that moved very fast. There wasn't enough time for the public to engage. And what we did hear from the public was resoundingly in opposition to it. Um, I, I just want people um, in the legislature to listen to the people of Iowa. And if it's a strong response in opposition, I want them to take that to heart and say, maybe there's some things about this idea we can improve. Maybe we need to slow down this process. Um, maybe this is a bad idea that we should not do. Um, but instead, there is an idea that certain folks know better than others and they don't need to listen. That really troubles me. So I'm, I'm really concerned about that on a whole host of issues. I've gotten over 700 emails in opposition to the bill that suppresses public land purchases. That's a lot of negative feedback. I've gotten none in support and still um, I feel like the members of the committee um, in the majority party are still saying we want to do this and we think it's a good idea. And I don't think honestly we can say that. And so that makes me really concerned. Um, I am encouraged by how many people I've seen up here at the legislature coming to talk to us, um, how many folks have been reaching out, um, how many groups there are empowering folks with the information they need to how to be engaged. I think that's just a really important thing. So groups like this do a really important function for our democracy. Um, so I find that really encouraging. I've seen a lot of young people very engaged in this process. Um, there's a number of state commissions that actually encourage young people to provide policy proposals um, and to get them up to the Capitol and help them understand that your legislators are here. Um, right, right before I jumped on this call, I was um, running up to the very top of the Capitol to show a group of EMS students from DMACC um, the, the very top of the Capitol because they were here, they wanted to see it. It's really important to me to give access to people. And so I love those opportunities. So please keep that up. I think it's just such a positive thing for our democracy. That's probably a lot more answer than you expect. <laughs> Thank you. Ingrid, did you have a, another question? Well, actually, it, uh... It looks like there's a question that in the chat, so I wanted to give an opportunity to that. Um, the the question in the chat, Senator, is what are the arguments supporting the two bills you mentioned? Bill, um, there is an argument that if we allow land to go into public use, it's not available for farmers, and that's going to suppress young farmers getting into farming. But the reality is it only suppresses the expansion of public lands. There's, I believe, 35 million acres in Iowa. And in the last four years, the DNR has um, accumulated only 14,000 acres. So at that rate, um, I think even to reach 1% of those, those farm farmlands in the public um, domain, it would take 102 years. So it's 
this is not um, an overwhelming and rapid movement to take lands out of production, but there's a lot of fear that if a land is considered public land, it's out of farming production, it's gonna inhibit farming. Um, I think there's other policies that could really help young farmers get into farming. The reality is land's really expensive. If you don't inherit it, it's just almost impossible to get into it. And I know a lot of refugee farmers who have moved to Iowa, um, want to be able to farm, are starting businesses through programs like Lutheran Services of Iowa's Global Greens program, and they can't even find land to rent um, at, a, at a price that's affordable to them. Um, and so maybe there's some ways that we can actually um, support those small scale farmers, those new farmers, the non-traditional farmers um, to um, give them those opportunities to farm in their communities. Um, and then I really don't know what the argument is in favor of expanding the deer tags for out of state um, folks. Um, I think it's maybe a, a more personal bill. Sometimes we see that legislators write bills for themselves or maybe one constituent, and then they wanna change all of Iowa code because of this one situation. Um, I think we need to be really careful when we do that and really listen to the people of Iowa and see how they feel about that. Well, I wanna thank you for joining us. I know you've got a run. Um, we appreciate what you and other elected officials are doing as public servants. It's not easy, I'm sure, um, lots to juggle, but thank you for your time this morning and for your service. Take care. All right, so yeah, lots of, of good um, updates and reflections this morning about specific bills, about ways you can be effective, about the importance of citizens being engaged with legislators and with the legislative process. We're gonna turn now to um, some training about just that. Um, so Alicia is gonna um, talk through some ways that you can be more effective as an advocate, um, ways that you can um, take what you've learned about these specific um, policy issues and, and really raise your voice um, this session and beyond. Alicia? All right, thanks, Brian. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so you all can see the presentation. Okay, so hopefully that's working. All right, um, so just a quick recap of uh, the tips that we heard from our um, guests this morning from Senator Trungariot and Senator Knoyer. Um, I think these are really great tips um, that you are able to reach out to the leaders in the legislature. These are committee chairs and party leadership that need to hear from everyone in the state, not just their own constituents. Um, I think that's really important. Um, it's important to be accurate and bring the facts that back up your statements and organizations like ours um, can help you find those facts. So we're always here as a resource. Um, keep your remarks concise and to the point um, when you're talking with a decision maker. Be creative, share your story, make an impression, but be respectful. And then also establish a relationship with your legislator early on. Um, so you're not just going to them uh, when you when you need something, having an ongoing relationship really helps you be an effective advocate. So we'll talk about um, more of that in the rest of the advocacy training this morning. So um, just a quick roadmap about what we're gonna discuss. I'm gonna go through um, the basics about our governmental system so we all have a baseline of knowledge. Um, together and then talk a little bit about why to get involved in advocacy, how to be an effective advocate, and then we'll go through a little practice of how to craft an effective message, and then we'll talk about some advocacy actions and tools that, that you can use. So our governmental system, this is going to be a little bit of a very basic social studies refresh, um, but just so we all understand, um, we have three branches of government in this country, the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. And those branches function at both the federal level and the state level. Um, so there are a lot of different places to be an advocate. There's a lot of different ways to get involved in different issues, depending on um, the, the level at which the issue that you're interested in is um, having an impact 
And so the Iowa Environmental Council really focuses on state level issues. We do some work at the federal level um, with regional partners and um, participating in, in other groups, um, fly-ins and advocacy days, but our work is primarily at the state level at the executive and legislative uh, levels of government. So in those uh, situations, where can you advocate at the executive level here in the state? That can be directly to the governor, or it can be to rulemaking agencies like the Department of Natural Resources or the Iowa Utilities Board. Those are part of the um, administration, part of the executive branch of government. And there are a lot of opportunities at those agency levels to make public comments or um, when those agencies come out with different plans um, to be involved in the in the process as stakeholders. So those are often overlooked, but you know, for example, the petition that we were talking about earlier um, that IEC filed, there was an opportunity for people to make public comments um, to the EPC um, uh, related to that petition. So those are some things that people might not know about as much, but that um, IEC really tries to uh, let folks know that there's opportunity to participate in those um, public comment periods. Then at the legislative level, this is kind of what we are more familiar with and we've been talking a lot about today, um, is how to get involved at the subcommittee level, the committee level, and then at the House or Senate or levels as a bill moves through the process at the legislature. There's opportunities at every stage to get involved and, and make your voice heard. So briefly, I just wanna also mention that there's a lot of great opportunities to get involved at the local level. Um, a lot of decisions are made at the more local level that affect people's everyday lives um, even more than at the federal or even the state level. So if you're interested in, in getting involved at the local level, we really encourage that. Um, there can be local level decisions made about zoning and public lands, and then also communities setting their own priorities and goals related to climate change, conservation, or other public services. So those are all opportunities to get involved and have your voice heard and really be able to make an impact um, at, the, at the most local level. So the path of a law, this is uh, kind of uh, how a bill becomes a law. Um, in the state legislature. So the Iowa State Legislature has two chambers, the Senate made up of 50 members and the House made up of 100 members. And so when a bill is introduced, it's introduced either into the Senate or the House, or it can be introduced into both at the same time. Um, those are called companion bills. And the bill has to move through this entire process on, on one side, on through the chamber and then it moves over to the other chamber and moves through the same process. So it's introduced and assigned to a committee and then subcommittee members are assigned to that bill. And that's usually three or five uh, subcommittee members. And that is a, the, the best opportunity for public comment because at those meetings, they actually have a public comment period. Um, so that's, that's a really great place to get your voice heard. Um, if it is passed out of the subcommittee, then it's debated and voted on by the committee. And at the committee meetings, there is not an opportunity for public comment. So it's really important to talk to committee members prior to that meeting. And so for example, the public lands bill that we've talked about already today, the SSB 3134, that committee meeting is this afternoon. And so if you want to reach out to your um, representatives uh, or your state senators um, to make your voice heard on that bill. It's important to do that before the two o'clock meeting. Um, and then of course there is the opportunity if it gets passed out of the committee to um, talk to legislators um, before it is debated and voted on on the floor the chamber level. And so if it is passed out of the chamber, then it moves to the other chamber and goes through the same process. And if it passes through both chambers, then it goes on to the governor's desk where she has the opportunity to either veto or sign the bill into law. And some important things about the Iowa legislature is that we do have a funnel system, which is a little unique. And so you've heard us mention that this week is funnel week. That means that 
on Friday, any bills that haven't moved out of committee uh, will no longer be eligible to move through the rest of the session. So they'll no longer be um, debated. And so there's a lot of action happening where um, legislators are trying to get bills uh, moved out of subcommittee and committees so that they can continue to be debated for the rest of the legislative session. And then there is the second funnel, um, which is later on and uh, bills have to make it out of the other chamber uh, committee level um, in order to continue being debated. Um, the only bills that are not subject to this are ways and means bills and appropriations bills. So tax and budget bills, those can be, those are funnel proof um, and can be debated throughout the legislative session. So why get involved in advocacy? I think, you know, anyone who, who's taking part in this session today understands a little bit about why it's important to be involved in advocacy. Um, but the fact of the matter is that politics does affect your life. It affects the range of options that you have to make um, individual decisions. And so it's really important to be involved in the process. The way that the process is set up is to have public involvement. So that's why there's opportunity for public comment at subcommittee meetings and along every step of the way. And it's really important for legislators and other decision makers to hear from their constituents um, because together we can have a collective impact. Um, you know, Senator Trungari had mentioned that she had gotten 700 emails from people about this public lands bill um, in opposition to it. Well, you know, the only way that that bill is going to get stopped is if there's like a big upswell of, of voices um, reaching out about it. Um, so it's really important to, to make your voice heard um, and be part of that kind of swell of, of voices. So some tips about how to be an effective advocate. Um, the first is to identify your issue. And sometimes, you know, this can be if you um, hear about an issue, you know, it's kind of identified for you that, you know, we have said that we think that this is important. Um, otherwise, you know, if you're being proactive about an issue, how do you identify what, what the problem is and how to address it? Either way, it's important to think through these questions about why you care about the issue and to be really clear about um, why it is that you want to take action on it, how it affects you personally, or how it connects to your values. And then also what the solution is. So what can be done about it and why is your solution uh, the best solution out there? Um, so being really clear about those things before you go and talk to your legislators is really important. Then identifying the decision makers that can actually have an impact on uh, the issue that you are, are interested in. So this could be, again, the state legislature at all these different levels. Um, if the bill that you're interested in is at the subcommittee or the committee level, you know, you don't necessarily want to go directly to your legislator um, who is not sitting on that subcommittee or committee if they are not taking action on it at that time. Um, it can be more impactful to, to wait until you know, they have an opportunity to, to vote on it or debate about it. Um, because they have a lot of things going on and, and they're tracking a lot of bills. So it's important to know along the way who the decision makers are along the step of the process that the bill is in um, or the other decision makers that could be involved. Like um, some decisions are made at the state agency level um, or you know, reach, reaching out directly to the governor or her office or talking with local officials about local decisions that are being made that are not necessarily being debated at the state capitol. So then it's important to do your research on who, on your decision maker. So what positions do they hold and what are their priorities? So this is um, a little bit chicken and egg if you, um, you know, are, are, know that you're reaching out to this committee or subcommittee um, person because you know that they are, have an opportunity to make a difference on the issue that you're uh, talking about. But if you're being proactive on an issue, it's nice to know 
if they are a member of a committee or a subcommittee and can actually introduce a bill for you or, or have a voice on the issues that you care about because they're members of the Natural Resources Committee, for example, or other things, or if they're a leader in their party or in one of the chambers. Um, it's also good to know what other positions they might hold within their community. So what occupation do they have? Um, being a state legislator is not a full-time job. Most um, state legislators have a, another occupation or a former occupation if they're retired. Um, and so that can really impact how they come at different issues and how they might view things. So um, you can also find out what other roles they might have with other organizations, if they're members of certain organizations, um, that can impact how they connect with the issue. And then um, researching what are their priorities. So this is important for how you can connect with a legislator about an issue, kind of how are they coming at it, what do they care about? What do they value? Um, and so you can learn about um, what their priorities are by you know, reading the news, looking at their websites or their past votes or campaign platforms, looking at other public information or talking with other constituents that have interacted with them before. So all of this kind of background research um, you know, may seem a little tedious, but it doesn't have to take a lot of time. And it's just important to, if you're gonna be the most effective that you can be in the short amount of time that you have with a legislator, it's really important to pick out some of these things so that you're tailoring your message to them in a way that's gonna be impactful. Um, otherwise, um, you know, it's, it may not be worth your time. So just taking a few minutes to, to look at some of these things can really help you be a better messenger. So once we've identified our decision maker and done our research, we can craft our message. So this is a message box tool um, that we've developed. It's kind of adapted from a few other different message box tools that you may have seen before. Um, so it's, it's designed to be really flexible, and so you can start anywhere in the message box and, and come up with a coherent and cohesive message for the decision maker. The way that I typically describe it is starting in the middle and then going up and clockwise. So um, the first piece of this is the issue. So telling your story. Um, you know, even if you don't have a really dramatic story about um, the issue that, that you're concerned about, it's important to talk about why you connect with the issue personally and why you are even, you know, taking the time to go and talk to your legislator or decision maker about the issue. Um, that makes it, you know, more personal to you and helps them understand why you're coming at the issue. Then describing the problem, you know, if it's not really clear in your personal story uh, what the problem is, it's important to lay out exactly what it is you are asking the decision maker to address. And this can be a good opportunity to incorporate some facts and figures into uh, your remarks. So one, one really good tip is not to overload legislators or decision makers with numbers and facts and figures, because that can have a really um, numbing effect on the conversation, but to have a few really good facts and figures that back up your, your point um, and using those to kind of highlight your discussion. Um, that's a really good opportunity for, for that. Then connect it to the values. So why does this issue matter to you and your community? And this is where your research really comes in handy about your decision maker. Um, trying to connect with their values, um, frame it in a way that they can relate to will help you get further with the conversation. So if you, you know, look into the, the legislator and find that they have a bunch of grandchildren, um, they're a big, big family person, you know, maybe connecting to values related to legacy and future generations and sustainability. Um, those might be more impactful to that particular legislator. 
or if the legislator um, really likes hunting and fishing, um, they're a big sportsman talking about um, having areas to go and, and recreate uh, or to go and hunt and fish um, could be really impactful to that particular person. Um, so, so that's where the research really comes into play and you'll be able to better connect with them on their values if you know a little bit about their background. Then comes the ask, what is the one specific thing you'd like them to do? So when you go to talk with a decision maker, it's helpful to focus on one thing and not try to throw a bunch of things in at the same time. Um, unless you're talking about, you know, a couple of bills, then you could talk about those, you know, separately. But if you're talking about one specific issue, make it one specific ask at the time. So it's really clear what action you are asking them to take. And then what I like to end on is the vision, kind of wrapping it up in a more positive way. What are the benefits of solving the problem that you're trying to address? What does the world look like if you're successful? Um, so really kind of sharing with them how you see the issue being resolved and the benefits of that outcome. All right, so contacting decision makers. There's a lot of different ways to contact decision makers to, to have your voice heard. And um, it's really dependent on the amount of time and your comfort level. Um, so it's normal to feel nervous as an advocate um, and we completely recognize that, but any action that you're willing to take or that you have the time to take is, is really important. And we really encourage you to, to take any action that you are comfortable with. So we kind of describe this in terms of low investment, medium investment, and high investment actions. So low investment actions that don't take a lot of time um, and are a little bit more um, uh, separate, I guess, a little less um, personal contact. If you're not feeling ready to go right up into an in-person meeting, you can make a phone call, send an email or mail a letter or postcard to your decision maker. A medium investment action would be attending an event like a town hall, a listening session, or a public hearing. And taking it a step further, you know, asking a question of the decision maker at that event or providing a comment, also taking notes and reporting back to a group like ours, um, that can be really helpful to help us understand what's happening at a, at a more local level with um, legislators in their own districts. Another option is writing an op-ed or a letter to the editor for your local paper. So that can help get the issue out in front of your community um, and get other constituents interested in the issue. And hopefully, um, you know, the legislators are in tune with their local papers and uh, um, we'll have an opportunity to see that and, and read that. So we're always happy to help people write op-eds or letters to the editor if you're interested in doing that. Um, please let us know and we can help you um, get them placed in, in the appropriate papers. And then lastly, the high investment actions would be uh, requesting an in-person meeting, going up to the Capitol and, and calling a legislator out of the chamber to, to talk with you. Um, you can also attend a, a scheduled lobby or advocacy day at the Capitol. Um, that's kind of what this event has been in the past, has been an in-person event at the Capitol, um, IEC's advocacy day. But there are other organizations that also have advocacy days and lobby days at the Capitol. So that can be, those can be really good opportunities, especially if you've never been to the Capitol before um, to, to get some help to figure out how it kind of works up there. Um, another idea is to organize an event for local friends and neighbors, you know, maybe just a small get together to talk about an issue, maybe watch a video and discuss or um, have a local um, elected official come in and join you and have a more casual conversation. Um, that, that could be something kind of fun and interesting and different um, if you are interested in getting involved at, involved at that level. So we'll talk about a few different advocacy tools, um, the legislative website, the Find Your Legislator tool, and IEC's legislative portal. 
So this is what the legislative website looks like. Um, it's, it's a little bit daunting to navigate. There's a lot of information here and you can see from the different tabs at the top um, that you can find out about the legislators, the committees, bills, um, Iowa code and, and all kinds of different things here. So um, the main things that I'm going to, to tell you about are the Find Your Legislator tool and a little bit about bill tracking. So the Find Your Legislator tool um, is available at this link. So if you don't know who your legislators are, it's really easy to go on this website and find out. Um, you just um, go to this Find Your Legislator tool and plug in your address, and then it will pop up who your state senator and your representative are, and it will give you um, links to, to those folks so you can find out what, their, what committees they sit on and their email and address, et cetera. So in this example, I just entered the Iowa Environmental Council's address into this tool and it popped up um, the state senator and uh, state representative that would uh, represent this area. So, and again, you could click through on these folks to, to learn more about them and connect with them directly. Bill tracking is another um, feature of the legislative website and bill tracking can be very tough and time consuming and confusing. And that's why organizations like ours exist to um, have folks where this is their job is to track bills and to provide inf information to our members and supporters about the bills that we are tracking because it can be um, difficult and, and um, it, it's just hard to navigate this. But um, so if you, you you know, our member with IEC or get our emails, you'll get our bill tracker and it will have direct links to the bills that we are tracking. So you can read the language and, and find out other information about the bills. Um, but if you wanted to go and look up a bill on the legislative website, you could do that um, using the, um, the search on the side here. And the easiest way to search is by number, if you know the number specifically. Um, you can also search by keyword, but that can be, you may get what you're looking for and you may not. So it's always better to have the number. And a little bit about the, the nomenclature that you'll see um, on, on the bill, on just the bill tracker um, is the way that number or the way that bills are filed, they have different numbers. And so they can be a study bill or a file. And so SSB or HSB means it's a Senate study bill or a House study bill. And that usually just means that it is a bill that has been filed by a committee or by an agency. So if the DNR introduces a piece of legislation um, or wants something considered, it will be introduced as a study bill. And if an individual legislator is introducing a bill, it's usually um, just given a file. Um, and study bills can then be renumbered as file numbers. So they'll change from SSB to SF after they've moved out of committee. Um, so that's why this is another reason why it can be really confusing to track bills because the numbers can change. And so we track all of that in our bill tracker. And then a companion bill is again, when a bill is introduced into both the House and the Senate at the same time. Um, they'll have different numbers, but they will be uh, companions. And then GA89 just means General Assembly 89. So that's the current assembly of uh, legislators at, at the state capitol. So our state runs on a two-year cycle. So this is the second year of the General Assembly 89. And next year after the 2022 election, when the assembly reconvenes in 2023, it will be GA90. And so that's just important if you're looking up bills from previous years and you're trying to use the bill tracker online. Um, if you can't find what you're looking for, it might be because it's under a different general assembly. So as an example, I pulled up a screenshot of uh, Senate Study Bill 3134 that we've been talking about this morning. Um, so if you were to search for this bill online, this is what you'll find. On the right side, you'll see the language. Um, if you scroll down, you'll see the full text of the bill. 
On the left side, you'll see the bill information. So GA again is General Assembly 89 and it has the dates. And then um, what are, what's really important here is also the bill history. So you can see uh, what stage of the process the bill is in and what has happened with it. Um, so this is a really helpful section. And then what we also find really helpful is this lobbyist declarations button. So you can click on that and see what other groups or potentially individuals um, have uh, registered on this bill as either supporting against or undecided. And so that can give you a little bit of an idea of um, where different groups have landed. So if you wanted to see how IEC was registered on this bill, you would you would click that button and you'd be able to see that. And then of course, IEC's legislative portal is a really good resource. So we have tried to capture all of these different tools um, and provide links and um, resources and other information in our legislative portal. So um, we just recommend this as a good place to start if you're curious about what's going on at the state capitol related to environmental bills. Um, we have all of our bill trackers linked and our legislative news bulletins. So it can really help you stay informed um, about what's going on. And these are some screenshots of our um, uh, action alert and our legislative news bulletin. So if you're on our email list, you'll get a legislative news bulletin every week where we recap what happened at the state capitol um, and provide links to our bill trackers and other um, relevant news and events. And then we also have, um, you'll get action alerts in your inbox, which you can also find online. Um, that will tell you when is a good time to take action on a specific bill. So if it is coming up for a committee meeting or a subcommittee meeting, um, we wanna let you know when is the right time to take action and provide some information about um, our messaging and, and why we think you should take action on a bill and um, uh, what to tell your um, state representative or senator about that bill. And then this is a screenshot of our latest bill tracker. So you'll see that um, there's a lot of information here and we update this weekly again. Um, on the left is the bill number and it has the hyperlink. So you can go directly to the bill language to read it yourself. It has um, a name and description, a sponsor, whoever introduced it, um, and then the current status of the bill, like if it has gone through subcommittee or committee, um, and then on the right side, oops, I didn't mean to click there. Um, our position, if we've registered undecided, in support of, or against a bill, um, we'll mark that on our bill tracker. And then lastly, um, our best recommendation is to get others involved. It's a lot easier to do advocacy. Um, when you're doing it with your fam family and friends and having a community of folks to, to be involved with, um, that can just help lighten the load. Uh, you know, sometimes these are really heavy topics. And so it's just great to build a community. You know, we, we really appreciate all the folks, all of you that are tuning in today. Um, you're part of our advocacy community. And um, that really helps us get through, you know, some, some, and sometimes when um, bills are moving really quickly that um, through the through the capital. So um, and also just having community to celebrate our wins together when we when we have wins. So always recommend bringing other folks into the fold and and building a community. So that is all that I have for the training. And so I'll stop sharing and then I think we're going to have some more time for discussion. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. Um, so we do have some time for conversation. If people are willing to stick around and share a little bit about um, your own experiences. Um, so I wonder if anybody would want to um, step up. You can um, 
I think you can raise your hand and we can unmute you is probably the easiest way to do it. But if anybody has um, a story they'd like to share of um, a way that you've, you know, put some of these ideas into practice, whether it's um, a letter to the editor, showing up at a legislative forum, having coffee with an elected official, um, visiting the Capitol, you know, responding to an action alert. Um, yeah, just we want to give a chance for a few people to share examples of uh, lessons learned from past experience doing advocacy. So don't be shy. Who, who would like to share an example? All right, it looks like Juanita's got a hand up. Go ahead, tell us about your experience. Hi, well, I'm actually uh, Dennis Harbaugh, um, okay. coming from Waterloo. Uh, a recent experience, uh, I have a lot of passion about, I was bottle bill and um, trying to get that updated and modernized. And, you know, I think we all have a network of some sort and in my case, I recently uh, went to our church who was looking for people to do presentations and uh, presented on the bottle bill and then set a very specific goal of a number of contacts that I would like, I wanted all of our church to make on that issue, either through email, letter, phone call primarily. And um, we exceeded that by about double because it's such a, an issue that touches people. And up here in Northeast Iowa, the bottle bill is basically falling apart. And um, I'd love to see um, Iowa environmental groups uh, kind of kind of move that up to a little higher on the priority list since it touches everybody in the state. Uh, but that's just one example of, of trying to tap into existing network of, of, of people um, and then finding out there's a huge amount of interest there. Yeah, thanks for sharing that example. So great point that, you know, these are things that um, kind of as Alicia said at the end there, um, it's more fun and more effective if we do it together with others. So you know, tapping into existing networks, whether those are you know, religious communities, um, local organizations that you're part of, um, or just friends and family, you know, inviting other people into that work, sharing why you care is, you know, really effective. It's good practice for the conversations that you can then have with legislators to you know, talk with the people around you first. So thanks for sharing that. How about somebody else? Another example of um, a different issue that maybe you've raised your voice about or worked together with an organization to do some advocacy on? All right, looks like we've got another hand raised. Is that right? Yeah, Mary Ellen, good morning. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. I'm without internet, so I'm on my phone. Uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't reinforce the advice to collaborate with like-minded groups to advocate an issue. A minor issue in the bigger scheme of the current session, but important to all tree huggers is the periodic attack on the forest reserve tax credit. And it sort of sometimes um, appears its ugly head and then sometimes it's quiet. But it's, as I said, it's not high on the list of urgencies, but uh, what we have done is form an alliance of all the various tree groups in the state. There are about 10 of them from loggers to growers to nurseries, actually probably more than 10. And that's been very effective. Uh, whereas a single organization like ours were small, wouldn't have much impact by forming an alliance and working collaboratively 
uh, on this issue, we've so far been successful in staving off any change. So uh, I, I, I see that as a very helpful avenue on some of these issues. I really appreciate it uh, this morning, by the way. I thought the overview, and I've been advocating for decades, but I thought the overview on how to do it, how to do it well, um, and just even being reminded <laughs> Uh, the bill tracker. Sometimes forget about that. Uh, so it was just an excellent presentation. Thanks for putting that together. together. Yeah, you're welcome, and thanks for all of your advocacy over the years. Um, great point about you know building um, diverse alliances. I think um, you know we know often that when you know when legislators hear the same thing from the same group over and over, um, you know. It, it's really important to bring in other voices. And so, um, as Senator Tran Garriott said, you know, the more diverse mix of um, constituents and organizations that we can bring together around an issue, the more um, important that that is in terms of representing the diversity of the state and the different constituents that, um, that are represented. So really important, whether that's tree groups or whatever other issues that you're working on to look for allies. Um, and especially the kind of unlikely allies, you know, it's, it's one thing to have the obvious partners together, but to really work to, to bring in a diverse mix of voices. Well, I wonder, so those are great examples of past advocacy. Um, we want to give people a, a brief moment to think about issues that you care about right now. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, we have a day scheduled on March 2nd, where we'll be inviting people to come to the Capitol. We'll be there to help if you want to meet with legislators. But it's really important, like we've learned, to schedule that ahead, to make some preparations, to do your own research, to think about who you might want to bring with you. Um, so, yeah, one way we can help prepare for that is to think right now together what are some issues that you care about, something that you might want to uh, raise your voice. And, and speak out about whether it's in person on the second or some other means. Um, what's something that you care about and, and some way that we as an organization can be a resource to you. So we'll give a, a few more people a chance to raise their hands and, and give um, some thoughts on something they care about right now that, that they want to, to speak up. All right, then I'm going to use my um, you know, background as an educator to uh, call on somebody. Uh, so I wonder, I know we have a couple people on who are um, who work at colleges, who work with students, who are you know thinking about issues in your classrooms, on your campuses. Um, I wonder if one of you um, would want to talk about issues that you're discussing that you hear from young people and you know things that you think um, they might want to speak up about, or you know, whether you're a student or Sophia Siegel from Drake or Rachel Brummel from Luther or anybody else who'd want to speak to that. I see Rachel's got a hand up. And Sophia, great. Um, Sophia, do you want to start? What are some things that you're thinking about or that you hear students talking about at Drake that um, the issues people might wanna engage around? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, last week I was, um, the students, um, the students at Drake Environmental Action League invited me to come and talk to them about kind of just like sustainability initiatives and uh, Drake's climate action plan. And one of the things, um, one of the things they, they kind of, they asked me slash like the sentiment that they kind of um, expressed is that they felt like they didn't really know like what to do. Um, and it, there seems to be a lot of kind of like burnout or exhaustion. Um, and I think they wanna see kind of see more changes and they just don't know how to act. 
Um, and so I would love to see, and I think, and I, I talked to them about this is um, learning how to engage in policy advocacy at the state and city level. Um, Cause I think a lot of the, the tools that you can like learn how to, to learn to advocate at the state and local level um, are applicable, you know, at an institutional level and kind of vice versa. Um, so I think that's something that's not taught in school, uh, you know, whether it's in high school or at the college level, that seems like such a common sense kind of uh, skill for people to learn, kind of how we showed up today to like learn how to, you know, reach out and contact our legislator. I think, you know, at least college students don't really know how to do that and they're not really sure where to start. Um, uh, Cause I think they just have, I mean, my students are interested in anything from like water quality to climate change to, you know, waste and compost and they're just interested in everything and they don't even know kind of like where to start, so. Thanks, Sophia. And do you want to say any more about who you are? You, you're at, you, you mentioned Drake Environmental Action League, which is one of our member organizations. Yeah, so, um, so my name is Sophia Siegel. I am the sustainability coordinator at Drake University. I graduated from Drake um, almost two years ago. Um, and yeah, I'm also on the, uh, I'm also on the board of uh, Iowa River Revival, um, which is a nonpartisan, um, I think we're a member organization of Iowa Environmental Council, um, but we're a nonpartisan um, NGO dedicated to restoring and advocating for Iowa's rivers. Thanks. Yeah, Rachel Brown was here, a professor at Luther College. I want to give you a chance if you wanted to add any more about your perspective. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian. And thanks, everybody, for um, for the presentation today. And I think some of my students are here as well. So I will speak for them since uh, since they're not necessarily, you know, they're learning. Um, but uh, I, I would echo Sophia um, and say a lot of my students are thinking about their own futures. They're thinking about what the world's going to look like when they're making decisions about where to live and if to have children and what their families are going to look like. And I think climate change is the biggest issue on their mind. Um, but I think it's also linked to issues, you know, I, I, I felt like you were talking to me when you're talking about karst topography. Um, we, we think a lot about water quality and health and, and environmental justice as well. Um, so I do think um, a lot of the a lot of the stuff related to climate change, um, people are excited about electric vehicles, um, thinking about, uh, you know, intersections between agriculture and, and carbon are in, in, interests of, of my students. Um, but they all have their own loves, but I think they're all thinking about um, what, what are my hopes for my future, what are my fears for my future, um, and what ways can I feel like I have a role in shaping that. So this is a really great, I think, tool, and I'm excited to chat with my students on Friday uh, about, um, about this experience. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I think just to echo what both of you just said, I mean, there's so many ways that um, advocacy starts, you know, really close to home, talking with the people we know and love and, and see in our communities, talking about the issues we care about, learning together, asking questions, um, working in, you know, the organizations and institutions that we're part of, whether it's, you know, working with people in your church to be more sustainable, working on your campus to think about how change happens. Um, you know, sometimes it's easier to wrap our heads around how power structures work and decisions are made, whether it's, you know, in our own households or in our, you know, schools or communities. And then, you know, really from there, building the confidence to um, speak out at the state level or the federal level. Um, but the important thing is, you know, hopefully you feel more empowered to do that after today's conversation, after thinking about specific issues, after hearing examples of legislators inviting conversation, um, and other examples of citizens like us who've um, taken the risk to go out and, and to have those conversations. I'm going to share my screen again and just mention a couple of um, last things as we wrap up. So we have events that I just want to mention to kind of build momentum and continue the excitement around being engaged in advocacy. So one is next week, we have what we call environmental mixology. This is 
um, a fundraiser, a celebration, um, and a time that will also do some advocacy, write some postcards about some of these current issues. Um, so this will be online. You can participate from anywhere around the state. We'll have music from Iowa blues musician Kevin Burt. Um, there will be custom cocktails. You can pick up the um, kits to make those. Um, and you know we'll do a little demo and lesson online with um, bartenders from Alleged Lee's about how to mix a custom IEC cocktail. So we appreciate everybody signing up, um, making contributions to support more of this kind of advocacy training, as well as um, the advocacy work that we do at the Capitol. And, and so this is a great fundraiser to help support this throughout the year. As I've mentioned, we also have an in-person advocacy day at the Capitol. This is Wednesday morning, March 2nd. Um, we invite member organizations like those that were just mentioned, Drake Environmental Action League and Iowa Rivers Revival, um, Trees Forever, lots of other groups will be tabling. Uh, we'll have information about the work they're doing, about bills they're tracking. Um, and then we'll also you know, hope that lots of legislators will come down and visit those tables. We would love to work with you between now and then to help you schedule a meeting. Um, individually or with a group from your part of the state so that you can speak to some of the bills that we talked about today. So this is a great chance to take the next week or two um, and, and really plan and prepare so that you can have a meaningful um, engagement with your elected officials at the state house. So there's information on our website and in the chat um, to uh, find out more about that event. But again, reach out to us if you need any help um, planning and preparing and scheduling a visit with legislator. And then just finally, one more reminder. So we have on our website, um, iaenvironment.org slash legislative. Um, we have a ton of resources. Some of the things that were mentioned today, um, we have the bill tracker where you can see what's the current status of legislation at the Capitol. You can sign up um, and see issues of our weekly legislative news bulletin where we give updates on those bills. Um, and then lots and lots of other information to help you find your elected officials to figure out how to send those emails. Um, but yeah, check that out. We send out action alerts when there are important issues that you can um, speak up about right away. And you'll also you know, be able to see when we're doing more trainings like this. So thank you so much for spending a couple hours with us this morning. I hope this was informative, inspiring. Um, you know, we are a broad coalition, like we said at the beginning, over a hundred different organizations, thousands and thousands of supporters across the state. And so it's really wonderful to have people like you gather with us to learn more and to get excited about um, how we can speak up. There's a lot to be um, concerned about in terms of legislation in our state, but there's, um, you know, also a lot of opportunity for us to raise our voices and work together with each other to make a difference. So thanks for all you do. Um, and we look forward to seeing you and hearing from you in the weeks ahead throughout the legislative session to be more impactful. Thanks a lot.